So can everyone, everyone see that, I hope? Okay. All right, so, so today I wanna to talk more about um, explicit reduction theory and I want to complement what others are doing um, who focus more on Voronoi's theory of perfect forms and the reduction theory there. So I want to look at uh, Coker's version of Voronoi's theory. So the main example that I'm thinking about and I have in mind is where the algebraic group is restriction of scalars from F down to Q of GLN, where F is a number field. And I, I want to work with number fields of arbitrary signature and for that reason, I have to use something a little different than, than sort of the classical Voronoi theory. If I wanted to work with totally real F or CMF, meaning a, a imaginary, completely imaginary quadratic extension of a totally real field, then I could use, I could work directly with Voronoi. And there's also another version of this reduction theory due to Ash uh, that was used as part of the construction of the toroidal compactifications. Um, it's rather different, but in any case, um, I'm gonna work with this Coker version. So let me, let me remind you of how the Voronoi uh, theory goes. Uh, just one second, I wanna pardon. So for Voronoi's theory, um, we have the cone of positive definite uh, quadratic forms sitting in invariables of the real sitting inside the vector space of all quadratic forms. And <laughs> we take the convex hull of this particular set of points. Uh, we take the integral vectors that are non-zero and we make rank one quadratic forms out of them. So I'm thinking of these as being column vectors in Zn. So when you multiply x times x trans by x transpose, you get an n by n matrix that, that is, uh, gives you a rank one quadratic form. So it doesn't sit inside C, it sits inside the closure of C inside the, the vector space V. And I'm gonna call these points C. And this, the convex hull of that set of points gives uh, a polyhedron. It's a convex set, it has, it's unbounded. It's not a polytope, it's unbounded, but it has, um, polytopal faces, okay? And the basic results that we know about this object is that if you take the maximal faces of this polyhedron, then they correspond to the so-called perfect forms with minimum one. And a perfect quadratic form, if you know you've seen it multiple times, but just to remind what it means is a quadratic form where if you have its, if you know the minimum that it attains on the non-zero lattice points, and you also know um, that set of points, then you can, given that data, you can recover the quadratic form from it. You can uniquely determine this, this quadratic form. Um, so there's an explicit algorithm to find the structure of pi, and Voronoi already gave it a long time ago. You know one face, and you know how to determine the you know, one maximal face corresponds to a given perfect form. And he wrote down one that works for any n, the so-called a n quadratic form. And if you take that form, um, you can look at the, the co-dimension one faces of this maximal face. So that's the facets of so the facets of the facets, so to speak. Um, and if you look across there, you, you're guaranteed to find another perfect form. And he tells you exactly how to do that. Furthermore, uh, the group S, L, and Z acts on pi. So the action is, you can think of it as um, multiplying on, so the, on the vector space of quadratic forms, you can take a matrix and multiply something by gamma on the left and gamma transpose on the right. Or if you want, you can also just act directly by multiplication on these original vectors in, in Z, N, in the usual way by an element of of S, L, and Z, and that gives an action on pi, preserves pi. So, and then finally, pi is known to have finitely many faces mod S, L, and Z. So when you um, take the quotient by subgroups of finite index of S, L, and Z, 
um, you're going to get a nice polyhedral decomposition. The cones give a polyhedral decomposition of C star, so that doesn't mean the dual of C, it means C with so-called ra rational boundary components. Those were the, pos the uh, semi-definite uh, quad quadratic forms, positive, semi-definite, so they're positive too. They're non-negative on everything, and they have rational kernel, so those are some uh, like little copies of, of other lower rank cones sitting at infinity. And this gives a model for the symmetric space for SLNR. So if you take um, the cone and you mod out by homothetes, by positive scalings, then you get a space that is in a natural way the um, symmetric space for SLNR. Okay. And finally, if you take these cones, because they're cones, they also descend to give you something in D. And also, um, if I want to add some extra boundary components onto D to enlarge it to Satake partial Satake compactification, then I can I get uh, cells there as well. In any case, I get a cell complex structure on, on D in the quotients. All right, and we also have the same if we instead work with positive definite Hermitian matrices mentioned that briefly in the last lecture. Okay, so now I want to generalize this because I want to, so that tells me those two examples of the positive definite um, quadratic forms in, in over R and in variables in the positive definite Hermitian form, they give me a way to treat certain examples. I can, for example, treat uh, SLNZ and its subgroups, and I can also treat SLN over an imaginary quadratic field and congruent subgroups of that. But I want to, to generalize this to try to work with more interest, uh, more exotic number of fields. So I'm gonna use this, this Coker theory. So the way it works is kind of abstracts this, this process of building these, these perfect forms into a larger setting. And you try to recover as much as you can of, of his theory with sort of as little input as possible, okay? So let me just go through how it works. So we start with a real vector space. Again, we have it equipped with a symmetric positive definite bilinear form. So that means that it's bilinear forms, bilinear and is a in both variable, linear in both variables. And if you plug the same variable, same thing in for both spots, you get positive definite quadratic form. So we say that a subset is a positivity domain if it's open and non-empty, and if you take any two elements from that domain and you feed them into this bilinear form, you get uh, something positive. It's positive on that domain. That's why it's called positivity domain. And this is sort of the biggest set you can have with this. So if you take anything in, that's in the vector space and not in the cone, you can find a point in the closure where on that point, um, you, when you evaluate, you get something less than or equal to zero, okay? So I'm using the letter C to denote this, but there's no assumption here that this is a cone. It's just some subset that's open and non-empty. Really no assumptions at all about it except what's written there, okay? Now he proves um, various things about this. One of, one of the first things he shows is that, in fact, this is a cone. This subset is a cone. It's closed under homothetes. And more than that, it's a proper cone, meaning that it doesn't contain any line, okay? So if X is in, is in the cone, the negative X is not in the cone. And there are some basic examples that I want to go through here of, uh, of this. So First of all, we have these first two that we've already seen several times. We have the um, cone of positive definite quadratic forms in n variables, and there's its dimension, n plus one choose two. We have the cone of positive definite Hermitian forms, which has dimension n squared. And then we have some, more, some other, um, other examples that are somewhat more exotic. So we also have if we take uh, the quaternion, so here H is the quaternions, and then it's a um, 
associative non-commutative division algebra over R of it's a four dimensional vector space over R. I know you guys have seen it before, but you can take n by n matrices in, in these things and you can look at Hermitian ones. So Hermitian ones just mean that when you take the, the transpose, you get the conjugate where now conjugation is inside H. And there's notion of positive definite for these. And when you take this cone, you have one of the, of the dimension over there, okay, 2n squared minus n. So these first three work for all n. There are families for all n. And the next one is an exceptional one. So here, O is the octonians. So it's this non-associative, non-commutative algebra over R of dimension 8. Uh, it's every, kind of the crazy cousin of R, C, and H, but it's definitely very useful in a lot of a lot of situations, rather unusual situations, but when you need it, this is exactly what you need. But in any case, we can make three by three matrices over this and look at Hermitian, Hermitian, uh, Hermitian matrices inside there and also look at the positive definite ones inside there. So you can also look at N equals one and N equals two, but those just give you previous examples that you've seen. So when you look at n equals one, you just I mean, you just get another example of the, of the first one. And actually n equals two ends up being this next example I'm gonna to come to. And you can't look at n bigger than three um, simply because, well, it just, it just doesn't work. You can't, if you, you can look at matrices, you know, so there's a, there's a sort of a geometric reason why you, this, this doesn't work. So associativity ends up being equivalent to a geometric property in projective geometry. And this property fails when you get above, um, if, if you don't have a non-associativity, it only works up to projective planes. So there's a projective plane over the octonians, but there's not a projective three space and a higher, a higher, uh, higher projective space over the octonians. And this fact that you have to stop here at at uh, Herm three is another manifestation of that. And this this is sometimes known as the Albert algebra. Uh, he was sort of the first person to really systematically study this. The next example is does exist for all n. Um, it is given by sort of the standard kind of calculus cone that you draw in calculus class, but you take sort of the upper part. It's sometimes known as the light cone of the spin factor. Another way to describe um, these cones, so, I want you, so the way to think about these is that we are familiar with the first two, sim plus r and herm plus c, and here are some other examples that maybe we would not have thought of considering, but they're also sort of going to be fair game for the kind of, the kind of theory that we work with. So they're also known as self-adjoint homogeneous cones because they have a large symmetry group, and they're also their duals with respect to the, this uh, bilinear form, okay? Um, and there's a classification for, for these self-adjoint uh, self homogeneous cones. They're also given by the certain algebraic structure. They're known to be in bijection with what are called the simple formally real Jordan algebras over R. So this is a, an algebra structure that probably most people don't run across that much. I mean, it's an example of non-associative algebra. So the associative law fails in these, this, the multiplication in this algebra, but it's commutative. So I, I guess when I think about it, I think about it as being, you know, we have another example of that kind of thing that's very familiar, which is Lie algebra. Lie algebra is non-associative, Lie brackets not associative but it's skew commutative. If you reverse the order in the Lie bracket, you get a minus sign. So this, if you want to, I'm, maybe you don't want to think of it this way, but you can, you could think of it as like being like the commutative analog of, of a Lie algebra. It's not, although that's not really maybe the most precise way to think about it, but in any case, it's non-associative and it's commutative. And say, saying that it is formally real um, just means that it is, if you have the sum of, a sum of squares in this algebra that's equal to zero, then individually those elements being squared have to be zero. So like sum of squares is zero means the things being, the inputs are zero. There's, there's a question in the chat. Can you give me a Oh, question? okay. I'll take a look yeah. at that. Oh, it's, it's from Actually, because I'm staring my screen, I don't see, uh, 
No, well, it says, hi, Paul, can you give a couple of examples of groups for which you would need to compute the emission? Um, um, yes, that is going to be on the next page. I will show on the next page. Good question. Um, yes. So uh, and just to finish this discussion here, um, uh, well, it's, you know, if you want to go take a look at that, that's great. Um, but the point is that these are going to be cones where we, we can expect uh, an analog of the sort of perfect form idea to work. And I thought when I first uh, was preparing this lecture that a positivity domain had to be a product or a direct, uh, direct sum, the vector space and the cone have to be a direct sum of these, of these things. But as it turns out that, you know, the more I dug into the literature, I realized that is not true. I mean, at least it doesn't appear to be true. The literature is rather confusing. Um, so I, I found claims that that is true and also claims that it's not true. So I don't want to say that. And all I can say is that to the best of our knowledge, um, these have not been classified in general. So these are some examples and these are definitely examples that people think about when they mention them, but there could be others. I don't want, and I don't want to uh, say that there are or are not. So sorry for that uh, ambiguity, but that was a surprise to me. Anyway, now that was, so it was an excellent question to ask about the groups involved. Um, so let's talk about that. So what, what possible groups are, what are the symmetric spaces that these are going to be models for? Okay, well, for the first two, we've already seen them several times and we know what they are. So quadratic, positive definite quadratic forms, we get SLN R over SON. For the Hermitian matrices, we get SLNC over SUN. Okay, now for the Hermitian, uh, Hermitian matrices over the quaternions, the relevant uh, Lie group is SLNH, okay? So in terms of arithmetic groups that you might consider here, you could consider SLN where the entries are uh, come from a quaternion algebra. There, so there's some order inside a quaternion algebra. The maximal compact subgroup here has, goes by various names, but one sort of standard thing to call it is SU, in H, and I say a little more at the bottom, I'll get there. Um, the, in the octonionic case, this one, because it's exceptional, it doesn't really have such a standard name, we, but in any case, it's Lie algebra is a certain real form of the complex Lie algebra of type E6. Um, there are several real forms here, and this is just, just one of them. And the maximal compact subgroup is a real Lie group of type F4. Now, if you go, so this is a, a specific symmetric space, G over K. If you go look in Helgeson at the list of the classification, Carton's classification of symmetric spaces, you'll see actually there are several uh, exceptional uh, symmetric spaces associated to the Lie algebra E6. There's, I think maybe three of them or four, I can't remember. And this is just one of those examples. So only one of them has uh, this model in terms, of, in terms of quadratic forms like this. And finally, for the, this other family, the light cone spin factor, we have orthogonal groups. So the, the Lie group is the orthogonal group of a quadratic form of signature 1n, and the maximal compact subgroup is SON, okay? And now I'll just say a little more about what this means. If you've never seen the, this uh, Lie group of SLN over the quaternions, um, well, there's various ways to say what it is. I mean, you know, we know for SLNR, SLNC, we just take the determinant and look at determinant equals one. Um, that doesn't work out so well when you have non-commutative things appearing in the, in the matrix. So there's a couple of ways to say what, what's going on here. So one way is, uh, I didn't write down, but there's a notion of a determinant called the Dudenet determinant. It's a, a determinant-like function on this group. And you can say, look at the things where the Dudenet determinant is equal to one. Another way to say, is there a question? Hello, there's a second, uh, second question. Does non-commutativity non of the Hamiltonians have any implications for algorithms? Say it again. 
does the non-commutativity of the Hamiltonians have any implications algorithmically? Well, I guess it depends on which algorithms you have in mind, but in terms of um, sort of this trying to build the polyhedron, in that case, you just have, you're just really working with, well, well maybe I'll, I don't want to say too much about what I'm going to say coming up, but I think in terms of building this polyhedron, I don't think it has any serious impact. I mean, certainly there are going to be other things like, for example, computing the determinant, it has an impact, but I don't, I don't think it has any impact in terms of computing or doing computations. That said, I haven't done any computations using it. So I don't know what will happen when one tries, but um, in fact, I'd be very interested for someone to try, but I don't expect there to be any problem from that. Um, okay, so back to SLNH, you can think of it in the following way. So given a quaternion, we can represent any quaternion as a two by two matrix over the complex numbers by like an analog of this restriction of scalars business that I was talking about before. So we can embed the matrices n by n matrices over the quaternions inside two n by two n matrices over the complex numbers. And then everything will work wonderfully in, in that way. And then if I take the special linear group inside there and take SL2NC and then intersect that with the image of this embedding, I'll make SLNH. And I can get the same, by the same way, I can construct the maximal compact subgroup by taking maximal compact subgroup of SL2NC and intersecting it with MNH. But there's another um, way that you might see this group referred to. It's also known as SP2N. And notice that the 2N is not a subscript, but it's in parentheses. So this is the compact form of the symplectic group where we're more used to the non-compact form, which is SP sub 2NR. But in any case, there's a variety of ways to, to think about what these are. Okay. All right, let me explain how his theory works. Okay, so the first step is, and so it's very general. So it's gonna, at first, there's gonna be a lot of flexibility here. The first step is you just choose a set and inside um, the closure of the, of the cone without away from the origin that's discrete in the ambient vector space. So it takes some discrete set at infinity in the cone that's non-zero. And then given any point in the cone, we can define the minimum of that point by just over the, with respect to this discrete set. So you, you take all the, the points in the discrete set you plug them in into the bilinear form with y on the other side and you see what you get. And we take the minimum, the infimum of that, okay? And then we take the minimal points. Um, these are all the, the points inside this discrete set where this minimum is actually a, a, achieved, okay? And then he shows that, so if you have the, discrete, the discreteness of the set, C, and the positive definiteness of this bilinear form imply that, okay, this minimum actually exists. It's actually attained. We don't have something sort of, you know, it's actually attained on the set. And moreover, the set of points where it's attained is finite, okay? Now for the, for quadratic forms and in, in variables, this is pretty clear. I mean, you have some discrete subset of, of your vector space where you can evaluate your quadratic form and all you're doing is, you know, if it's discrete and you have a positive definite quadratic form, then of course, in any, there's a, the only the minimum can only be a, obtained on some finite set, and certainly it will be obtained by somebody as long as you, so. And then this, but proving this in this case is really just it's really the same proof. It's just, uh, you know, sort of more abstractly written down in terms of this this data, but it's the same it's the same thing. Okay, but notice that we're not really assuming anything about this set other than that it's discrete. So that's, that's a, already a big difference. And now in terms of uh, you know, getting back to analogy with Voronoi, we say that 
this y is a perfect point if when you take the set of uh, minimal points where this where this minimum is achieved that spans the vector space v okay so if it has sufficiently many linearly independent uh, and they're not so dependent then we're going to say that's a perfect point so this is like a perfect quadratic form except that we don't we're not calling it a quadratic form we just say it's some element in some cone and then we given our set c we let v of c be the set of perfect points for that set normalized to have the minimum equal to one okay so if i have a if i have a perfect point then any multiple of it is also a perfect point, but for a different, you know, the minimum value changes when you when you scale like that. So if I normalize to have the minimum equal to one um, by choosing a representative in the ray generated by y, then I can um, have a give a unique point here. Okay, and just just to remind you, in the Voronoi case, this cone C is the positive definite quadratic forms, and the set. C is these rank one quadratic forms, this particular set of rank one quadratic forms, and they all living at infinity, okay? But now we really are not putting any restriction on C at all. We just say it's discrete. Then, of course, with that level of, of generality, um, probably nothing valuable is going to happen. I mean, like we're not gonna get something useful if unless we put some more conditions on, on, a, on this set C. So the first thing that we would want is we would want um, you know, something where we're at least gonna have a shot at getting polyhedral decomposition, okay? So he, but he identifies sets and by some other condition that, that are useful, okay? And calls them admissible sets. So we say that C is admissible if the following is true. If you take, a sequence of point, any sequence of points in the cone tending to a boundary point, okay, for any sequence, you have to have the minimum of that sequence with respect to the set C tending to zero, okay? So in other words, um, well, I mean, it's just what it is. If you take the sequence going to infinity has to have the minimum going to zero. The minimum can't stay bounded away from zero um, so this, I guess one, one way to think about it is the set C has to be able to detect, it has to be large enough to detect all possible sequences tending to the boundary in the sense that it, it um, makes them go, makes this minimum go to zero. But if you admit this definition, admissible, he proved that if you take an admissible set, then the normalized perfect forms are actually a discrete subset of the cone. So they form a discrete subset. And you can use them to make a polyhedral decomposition. So given a perfect form, we can let we can consider the cone generated. Uh, now I'm calling them forms. I shouldn't call them forms. I should have been careful and called them points, sorry. But given a perfect point, we can, if we take the cone generated by its minimal vectors, then they give a polyhedral decomposition of the big cone C, okay? In other words, if you, take, I mean, these, these points, uh, C live at infinity. So if I want to only decompose the cone, um, like with a sort of a classical kind of reduction theory, I have to take the intersections of these uh, perfect cones with, with C itself. But as I range over all the minimal points of these intersections, I get a, sort of a, a decomposition into uh, the big cone into these polyhedral cones. And it's a nice decomposition in that any two cones, uh, the only way they can intersect is in a proper face of each of them, okay? And that's really sort of exactly what um, Bournoy is giving us. All right, now I want to, I mean, so that's still, you know, still a lot of flexibility on what C could be. As far as I know, we don't know sort of what the large, you know, what the sort of most useful class of these sets is. But in any case, we're gonna, we wanna pass to GLN over number fields. So I want to take a specific one, all right? So, so let's take F to be a number field of signature RS. So when you tensor it with R, you get R to the R, oh, that's, uh, you know, R to the R times, sorry, not tensor, R to the R times C to the S. 
and we want we're going to want whatever we take we need to have um, some kind of GLN OF action on the result so to be able to do that we need to we need to make sure that's built into our our points at C and so I'm going to we're going to do that by mimicking what happens and what Voronoi did I mean how did Voronoi do it Voronoi did it by he wanted SLNZ to act so he took um, Zn, vector where SLNZ certainly preserves that set, and then use that set in a reasonable way to build the set at infinity C. Okay, so let's look at the look at the the setup we want to take. So first of all, we need to choose our vector space in our in our cone. So for each place of F, it's either real or complex. We have R real ones and S complex ones. We're going to take a copy of the cone. A, co a copy of the vector space of the appropriate type from our big list that we wrote down on the other slide. So if we have a real place, we take the vector space to be this uh, symmetric matrices, n by n matrices over R. If it's a complex place, we take the Hermitian n by n matrices. And then for the cone, we take the appropriate positive definite subcone. Okay. And now we have some extra, so we have an extra normalization, a little coefficient. We're gonna, this is rather typical for, um, for this kind of business, but you take this coefficient to be one for the real places and two for the complex places, so just a normalization. And finally, we have, we're gonna define um, a transposition operator on the places and we make it be the ordinary transposition if we have a real place. And if it's in a, a complex place, we put this to be the conjugate transpose. Okay, so that's sort of our ingredients for each place. And then we make our cone by taking the product over these things and sending it inside the vector space that's the product of these individual pieces. So we have a copy, our, our cone is a, is a product of cones. It's a product for each each of the infinite places where we have the positive definite quadratic forms for the real ones and the positive definite Hermitian ones for the imaginary ones, okay? That's our big space with our positivity domain in there. And now what do we do for our bilinear form? Well, we're gonna use the trace form on each of these individual pieces and we're going to sum them up over the over the infinite places, and when we throw in this extra coefficient just uh, for normalization purposes. Okay, and so you know from uh, previous talks about uh, Voronoi that this product, taking the trace of the product is the right, right thing to do in, in those uh, quadratic form setting. Okay, now for our set C, what do we do? Well, I want to, like I said, I want to mimic Voronoi's, but now I have all these places. I want to take, I'm going to take my ring of integers and, and F and take vectors over that. And now I take, um, I'm going to take the non-zero guys there. And I'm going to do an analog of this Q map that we've seen before, where for each one, I'm going to for each of these points, I have an, you know, I have these list of embeddings and I'm gonna use each of these embeddings to make a rank one uh, quadratic form or Hermitian form, depending on the place. So I take the vector X to this tuple of rank one things. That's what this is, is supposed to mean here. Where of course in the, uh, the real ones, I take X times X transpose. And in the imaginary ones, I have to take X times X conjugate transpose. Okay, so that gives me some collection of points that's at infinity in this cone. If I take the C closure inside V, these points are all going to live there because they certainly don't have any kind of positivity property. Because they're ranking in, the, in each component, they're rank one. Okay, and this is an admissible set. And so we get a GLN OF equivariant cell decomposition of this cone. And that can be identified with the symmetric space for the group that we want. Okay, and notice by construction, uh, GLN OF acts on this. Just it acts either. I mean, so how does it act? Well, it acts by um, the appropriate 
it's not conjugation, but I don't know what the, if there's a standard name for it, but in the quadrat, in the real places, it's going to act by um, acting on one side, act on one way on the left side and by the transpose on the right side. And in the Hermitian case, it acts by multiplication on the left and conjugate transpose on the right. But we use the different embeddings to pick which matrix we're going to use over there, okay? So the, the, each GL, GL and OF has all these different embeddings into, the, into these to C or R, or matrices over C and R based on uh, which place we're using. And we use those in, the, in each spot on these big tuple. Okay, does that make sense? Are you okay with that? It's really hard to tell without seeing any, anybody, but no one is complaining. Probably because you had a luxurious, satisfying lunch. And I did not, but in any case, it doesn't seem like anyone's complaining. Okay, so, so we've done this in, in some examples, um, joint work. So this is, you know, I, I, I'll give references, like I said, but this is all joint work with various co-authors. Uh, so a short list would be Don Yasaki, Avner Ash, Mark McConnell, uh, Farshid Hajir, Stephen Donnelly, Aria Clogus month as various people that, that we've um, we've had enjoyable collaborations with. I uh, I'll make a I'll make I'll make a list in the references. I don't uh, didn't want to write too many names here, but this particular project was um, this polyhedron. I will say was computed by Don and published by Don, um, and it was used in the joint project with with Don and Farshid Hajir. In any case, the field in this case is the field given by taking the fifth roots of unity. So the cyclotomic field Q zeta five. Um, this is a totally complex field. In fact, it's a CM field. It's an imaginary quadratic extension of the field uh, Q square root of five. So it's special. It's even more special than just a sort of a generic kind of totally complex field. But in any case, because it has two complex places, the domain in this case is positive definite Hermitian two, two by two matrices. And there's two copies of them. So each one of them has dimension four. So we have real dimension eight. The vector space has dimension eight and the cone is an eight dimensional cone. So it's not that, not that big. I mean, in terms of SLN over Z. So SLN, SL3 is dimension five. SL4 is dimension nine. So it's right around the same kind of ballpark size as that, okay? Um, so modulo the action of this, uh, so we, we, we do exactly as we said, we make this polyhedron, make the cones on the faces of the polyhedron. And we find that modulo the action of the discrete group, there's just one perfect form. Um, maybe in this case it's legitimate to call it a form because we're working with uh, the CM case, but in any case there's only one and it has 240 minimal vectors. Now just like with, um, as you see with SLNZ, if you have, if X is a minimal vector, so is negative X because we have this root of unity inside, inside Z that doesn't change the, the minimum we plug into the quadratic form. Here, if we have two minimal points, minimal vectors that are related by multiplication by root of unity, then they give the same point inside, um, inside, the, uh, inside the space there, inside the admissible set C. So actually inside the domain, we, the cone has only 24 spanning rays. So it's 240 potentially because that's how many minimal vectors we have. If we count them all with all their signs and generalized signs from these roots of unity, but when we look inside the uh, the domain, we only see 24 spanning rays. And the reason that it's 10 and not five that we divide by is because if you have a fifth root of unity, you automatically have a tenth root of unity. You just take a negative of it. So we have to divide, get to divide by 10. That's better. I mean, it's nice nicer to have fewer points in your cone than it is to have spanning your cone than it is to have more. This is definitely a case where Less is better. And then you can, you know, using techniques talked about in other lectures, you can find the, 
easily compute the, the cones module of this discrete group and all the faces of it. And there's, there's what we find. So um, there's this one eight dimensional cone and then it has its faces up to the action of GL2OF. There's five seven dimensional faces, 10 six dimensional faces and so on, okay? So there's an example. There's another example, which is in some sense, completely opposite world from, from the one we just did. So this is now going to be a mixed signature field. It's, it's uh, not Galois, not CM, not anything. It's just a cubic field that is, um, it, has, it has a signature one, one, okay? So in other words, it had, this polynomial has one real root and it has uh, two, a pair of complex conjugate roots. This is the smallest cubic field. And if you look at lists of tables of cubic fields, so it's a natural one to start with. And in this case, we have the positivity domain has dimension seven because we take a copy of quadratic forms in two variables. So that has dimension three. And then we take the Hermitian guys in two variables and that has dimension four. Now this time we find actually, oh, it should be an OF, not an O2. Sorry for these typos. Uh, we, we, have, we find quite a few more. So we have nine perfect, perfect forms in this case. And seven of them give simplicial, simplicial cones. But the others are slightly larger. The others have uh, eight and nine, nine vertices. Now, in this case, the only root of unity that, you know, you know, if you look at the minimal vectors, the only thing you can do to them is multiply by negative one. That's the only root of unity that you have here. You don't have any extra one like we have in the um, Q zeta five case. And you sort of, you don't have, so because of this, you have, you have more forms at the top and you have, you have a lot more forms appearing, a lot more faces appearing in these cones. It's just a much more complicated object. But I, I guess you might think this is somehow more of a generic one. It doesn't like the other one, the Q, Q zeta five, this is a much more symmetric example. It's sort of more symmetric than it should be in, in, as, a, as a field. Whereas this one has no symmetry, it's not Galois, it's just a, it's just a cubic, okay? All right, so in the last bit of the talk here, I want to um, discuss some problems that one could potentially consider to, to think about. Um, and the first thing I wanna talk about is about the set C. So it's certainly not a coincidence that Coker's theory looks like Voronoi's because that's what he was generalizing. But it, if, if you look at it more carefully, you see that actually there's a really big difference, okay? And that it's not necessarily so visible in this example that I'm talking about. The set C really is, you know, in principle could be quite arbitrary. For what, what we're doing for GLN over this field, uh, field, we took a very specific set for it, okay? We took a very specific set. But it's still, it's very different from what happens in the case of the rational numbers or quadr imaginary quadratic or even totally real or CM. In those cases, when you make this natural set C, they sit inside a lattice, okay? So for example, in the case where F is the rational numbers, when I take this set C, every one of those rank one quadratic forms that I'm getting there is gonna have integral entries, right? Obviously it has integral entries when I do that multiplication. So it sits inside um, the integral, the, nat the obvious integral lattice sitting inside the vector space of symmetric n by n matrices. Okay, it sits in a lattice. But in general, that's not true. That is just simply not true. When you take the set, there's no lattice and let's say this negative 23 example, this negative 23 cubic, we had our vector space, <clears throat> excuse me, was seven dimensional and they're really, you know, seven dimensional over R, right? So there's like seven dimensional real vector space. And certainly we could try to look at some, you know, lattice sitting inside there and try to and, and hope that these points that we constructed live there, but they just don't live in a lattice. They do if the field is totally real or if it's a CM field. So even in the case of a totally complex field, some of those are CM and some are not, and there's a difference between those two examples. 
okay? But not sitting inside a lattice from the point of view of computations um, is a pretty nasty fact, okay? So if you are working with real numbers, like you're doing some kind of computation with real numbers and you happen to know that they live inside some lattice in somewhere, then that really means that you're working with some kind of, you're really working with rational numbers with respect to that lattice, okay? You, you really, it's, it's not really like true real numbers somehow. It's not really like nasty floating point numbers. And that's really, we don't wanna, we really don't wanna have to work with that um, if, we, if we can avoid it just because there's all kinds of problems that, that come up in trying to do computations and floating point arithmetic that are just make it a lot nastier. I mean, even completely trivial things like how do you tell when something is zero? Maybe it's very, very close to zero, but maybe it's actually equal to zero or maybe it's not, or maybe, it's, maybe there's some error and it should be zero, but you screwed up. You just, it just becomes much more painful to deal with that. So here's some consequences of, of this fact. So first of all, these perfect points, really they're tuples of matrices. We have a matrix for each of these places that we, that we wrote down, okay? Those matrices a priori are just floating point number matrices. And the cases that we're used to, like you know, the perfect forms for F equals Q, the classical Voronoi theory, those are rational, you know, rational um, quadratic forms, right? They're, they have rational coefficients. We can get rid of the denominators, make them integral if we want, potentially change the minimum in that way. But in any case, they're not just some random floating point matrix, symmetric floating point matrix that happens to be positive definite. But now these tuples don't necessarily come from F via those embeddings, okay? That's just the way it is. They don't, they don't come from that. So we, because we don't have a lattice, this non-existence of a lattice sort of screws that up. And we have to use floating points um, arithmetic to do these computations. And that is, that's quite painful. However, it doesn't mean that they you know, have no structure at all. It just means it's not really understood. So this is something, this is certainly something that's known to experts. Although the last time I talked to, talked to them, just a few years ago, it was, in, it was in, in person. So that tells you something. But uh, they said they were aware of this fact, but they didn't really know how to um, make use of this. So if you actually look at these, at these matrices that you're getting, you know, the analogs of these perfect forms, you see that they're not just some random floating point numbers. It, it, it's clear that they are really coming from, not from F necessarily, but from the Galois closure of F, okay? So in this case, this is a, this is a non-Galois cubic field that had uh, its, in its closure, Galois closure is a, is a degree six extension with S3 as its Galois group, okay? And if you look at these entries that we write down, so here's an example of a perfect form sent to me by Don. Um, I've written down the matrices over the real numbers. Um, the first one is the matrix that's inside the positive definite quadratic forms. And the next one is in the Hermitian ones. That, that's really supposed to be I, like the complex number I there. Okay, and that's positive definite Hermitian form. Now, if you look at those numbers, you can use GP per E to try to figure out where they come from. And of course, I don't just have these to six decimal places. I have them to you know, many, many decimal places in this file. So using the algedep routine in GP per E, you can see that all the real numbers that you see there, those, the six, uh, well, there's three in the first one that are different. And then there's two others, the diagonal of the next one. Those all actually live in F. If you compute, you know, clearly they live in F if you, if you trust the output of algedep, which of course everybody does. And then the other ones, the off diagonal elements in the Hermitian guy, those imaginary you know, complex numbers, um, those do not live in F, but they live in the Galois closure of F, okay? They could live in F because F does have complex embeddings, but it doesn't, they don't live in F. They actually live in outside of F in the Galois closure. So really there should be some way to do these computations just working with the Galois closure and doing something appropriate there. But as far as I know, it has not been worked out how to actually do that and to make it useful. And that would be very helpful 
if true, because we want to do more examples. And but this floating point business makes it very annoying. Okay, so that's the first problem I want to just say. Uh, try to make this useful from a computational point of view. This observation. Um, okay. Hope it's clear that what the problem is. Um, the next thing, uh, so in, in Voronoi's theory, the way his algorithm works is you start with your maximal face of the polyhedron and then across the facet of that face, you find another one, okay? And you keep doing this, you keep growing by moving out across the faces of the polyhedron until you've, you know that you have everything up to the action of SLNZ, okay? Now, what could happen, which doesn't happen in Voronoi's theory, is that you could wind up with a facet that happens to lie completely at infinity, okay? It doesn't happen in his theory, but it could happen. And there are actually generalizations of Voronoi's theory, and I, I be very careful here. I don't mean the Voronoi one, which is about perfect forms, but his other uh, famous paper on reduction theory, Voronoi two, which I don't know as well. There are generalizations of that where it's sort of the same kind of algorithm is, is the game that you use, but you do wind up with this fact. You have these dead ends where you run into um, facets where there's no other uh, perfect cone lying on the other side, okay? And when I've talked to experts about this, um, they've told me that actually we don't know if this is what happens for Coker's theory. Even in this special case, of GLN over, over a number field where we've written down this exact uh, admissible set, okay? There could be. Um, in the examples that we've done, there, there certainly are not any. So we would believe that there aren't any for, for this example of GLN over a number field, but we don't know. We don't have a proof of that. There could be, as far as, to the best of my knowledge. Um, okay. I hope that makes sense. Um, here's another problem. So this, these cone models for symmetric spaces are really about GLN, not about SLN. And in most cases, there's, you know, there's not really a huge difference. But when you start to have units in your number field that are of infinite order, you start to get a difference. The GLN matrices over that number field can have an arbitrary unit as determinant and that's now a big can live in a big group whereas SLN is stuck being determinant one. But in most applications, people really prefer this, you know, SLN instead of GLN. There's definitely uh, I, mean, I don't want to use the word prejudice, but I would say a, a preference for using SLN instead of GLN. And here's the classic example. When you do SL2 over a totally real field, you get Hilbert modular varieties and those are beautiful, fantastic algebraic varieties. That everybody loves, but when you use GL2, you end up getting bundles over them with torus fibers, and they are they're not algebraic varieties anymore. Okay, but you know, morally speaking, it's the same thing. What's a torus bundle between friends? It's essentially the same object, but everybody would definitely prefer to be working directly with the Hilbert modular thing, if only because the dimension would be smaller. And you could do, you could potentially do more some more stuff with it. So. Can we, the problem is, can we use this theory that gives us a way to um, give polyhedral decompositions for GLN to produce ones for SLN, okay? And the obvious idea is to just take those torus fibers, which now had themselves in the quotient have all kinds of cells in them um, coming from the polyhedral decomposition and squash them away. And hopefully we'll get cells, a cell decomposition in the Hilbert modular variety. And that may not work. I mean, something may go wrong with that, but that's at least a possibility of what you might do. Um, so I think it's an interesting problem because I think um, I mean, there are, there is explicit reduction theory for these Hilbert modular varieties. I mean, it goes back to, to Ziegel and then uh, as we as we heard in the other Lecter Stromberg has uh, done some, some work with this recently. And there are other examples in the literature. Um, but this Voronoi method is really, it, you know, it works very well and it, it gives a sort of a very quick way to build these 
these decompositions. So if there's some way to do to use this to do that, that would be that would be excellent. There may not be, but um, I believe there should be. Okay, um, we don't have uh, a lot of data of these decompositions. I mean, we we've done some of them, but we haven't really just to sort of proof of concept, but we haven't really pushed it. Um, so I think it'd be worth it to try to do do more. And this would be used, especially in this case of mixed signature. So for example, these two uh, classes of fields here, cubic field of signature one, one, or quartic field of signature two, one. Um, these are example of what are called almost totally real fields because they're you know, barely not totally real. They just have one uh, complex place instead of having zero. So they're just, but these are nice because they have deficiency one. So we expect to see lots of torsion in their cohomology. And these are in the in sort of a computationally accessible range. These are not um, sort of giant examples. So we already talked about the cubic field. Um, that was a seven dimensional cone. And so now here with the quartic field, I guess we have four plus three plus three, I guess that's 10. So that's not uh, not that big. I mean, we've, we, we can handle cones like that, another example, so why not here? We've definitely, since these first investigations were done, there's been a lot more uh, progress, a lot more work done with computations like this. So so I would say let's, this is, the problem is do more of them. We, you know, we, we need to be nice to have a lot more data here. And there's a challenge and that is the Albert algebra one. That one, um, I know I've, I've said it before, it'd be really interesting just to see what happens for that. It's sort of, it's a unique thing sitting there on its own, it's lonesome. And it would be kind of interesting to work out what, what the polyhedral decomposition looks like. But I think this is still uh, beyond our, our abilities to compute. As far as I know, um, it's a big example. Okay. Um, Another fact that I've mentioned for Coker's theory is that there's a lot of flexibility, at least a priori, in what we could use for this set at infinity C, okay? We have ones that we know and love that we've used many times, um, but there could be other ones. Another thing is that he doesn't really, you know, there's, there's not um, a, disc a natural discrete group built into his construction. Okay, so if we were interested in other discrete groups, um, we could potentially use his construction to make fundamental domains with them without using sort of the full thing. So here's, here's one sort of motivation for why that could be a valuable idea. So we know that the Voronoi polyhedron is very complicated. That's an understatement. When you get up to GL8, um, it really, really becomes a beast. So, and the, why is it so complicated? Well, it has to have an action of SLNZ on it and SLNZ has some pretty intricate finite subgroups, okay? So it has, to, it has to know about all those. It has to know about all these possible finite subgroups of SLNZ and there are a lot of them. As N goes, gets bigger and bigger, well, they get worse and worse or better and better depending on your point of view. There's a lot of them, but in many, you know, this computational work that at least some people do, we, we're not, you know, it's just, a, again, a preference. We're looking at various groups that are usually don't have sort of all the possible torsion that, that might arise. They maybe have relatively small torsion and sometimes they may even be torsion free, but they, we don't necessarily, you know, you know at least the kind of stuff that, that I'm doing with uh, the people that I work with, we're not we're not really trying to get into the, all the beautiful symmetries of SLNZ. And the Voronoi polyhedron knows about all those. So it's possible that there are different choices of C that will give different polyhedral decompositions that are you know, better to work with in these, these kind of problems. And so I just suggested one here. So I mean, we talked about this group gamma naught of N, which is a certain congruent subgroup of SLNZ. Um, where, you know, if we were interested in studying polyhedral decompositions on which that group acts, what if we try to build that into the story from the beginning? So instead of working with SLNZ and then passing to, you know, th that's doing something that's going to work for any possible congruence subgroup, why don't we take this one 
and just take a some fixed rank one quadratic form and take C to be that set. Does that work? And does that give something useful? I don't know, I haven't tried it, but it's an idea. So the, I mean, if this doesn't work, but the first question is a little more vague. Are there different choices of this admissible set that are useful for computations? If say you don't, don't want to know everything that you could possibly know about all the finite subgroups of S, L, and Z. Of course, if you want to know that, then you're, you, know, you, you don't have a choice, but I think. But if, you don't, if you're not interested in that or you're studying something else, then maybe there's a better way to do it that can allow us to get to bigger examples, okay? And finally, um, we don't know um, sort of how Coker's theory interacts with compactifications of the locally symmetric space, okay? Because it's, I mean, we, I mean, clearly it's, it's, it's nice and there's something nice happening there, but we don't, we haven't, it hasn't been worked out in general sort of what's going on there, okay? And, you know, in fact, we don't, in general, don't know how to make a Satake compactification if we have a reductive group. That's Satake, that list of compactifications that I wrote down the other day, um, we talked about the borel serre and the reductive borel serre Those make sense for reductive groups. But so talking compactifications by its construction um, kind of throws away information about that central torus. When we talked about the, um, how reductive groups are related to semi-simple groups. So, so talking compactifications are really about semi-simple groups. And now when we're doing this Coker reduction theory, this is really something for um, a reductive group. And it's clear that what we're making is, you know, even though there's no definition, it's clear that this must be giving us a CWD composition on something that's a Satake compactification of, of this uh, locally symmetric space. It's because, you know, that, well, that's, that's what it is. But we don't have, a, we, don't, we can't say that's what it is because we don't have a theory to even say what a Satake compactification for reductive group is. So, the first problem is to show that this does give uh, um, this nice CW complex structure. And then uh, this is a much bigger problem would be to try to develop a, Satake, a theory of Satake compactifications for reductive groups. It should be a, a, I think it would be a really interesting mix of the sort of classical Satake compactification theory and um, toric varieties, because this is the central, the torus, the central torus is what's missing here when you go from semi-simple to reductive. So it should be a nice blend of those subjects. And just as a final, I know it's exactly well, a little bit over in here, I just wanna finish one more sentence. And that is that um, there's a paper by uh, G and McPherson on a different, kind of more geometric approach to these compactifications of locally symmetric spaces um, that may be a, a, a way into that, that may give a way to try to build these. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Paul. Um, are there any comments or questions? Oh, Philip has a question. Sir, do you hear me well? Yes. Um, not, not really. Okay. Let me turn my volume up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because it's not. Wait, maybe. <laughs> yes, but it's for the other. Oh, sure. I can hear something. I'm not sure what I'm hearing. Sorry, it's, it's not my intent. Yes, okay. So do you hear us better now? Um, I, I guess, might as well say yes. <laughs> Just speak up. Okay, so anyway. Uh, yeah, I wanted to comment and, and on the first problem that you mentioned, uh, in the one on the dead end, yeah, and the one on the GLN two SL, because I'm not sure that I understand what you mean. Uh, okay. So for for this one, uh, so it's uh, so I check if it was written uh, in the talk of Renaud Coulangeon. Uh, last week, but I, I think that he did, it, he, did, he did say, and uh, he knows that he can prove that for the Warner generalization, at least for number of fields, there are no dead ends. Okay, great. 
Okay. Then I would recommend that no one work on this problem. Yeah, in fact, we are working with uh, Bill and Renault about it. So okay, maybe I didn't know that. That's yeah. so that's a, that is a new result. But but maybe I'm is pretty confident about it. So so on the other problem, I. I well, can I ask one thing? Um, but uh, but yes. so given that that's true, would you ex would you expect uh, sort of in general that to be true for his for his uh, theory or is well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm truly okay. I'm 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 seeing in the really in the maybe number field the number field case, but more the imaginary uh, imaginary one. So not not uh, the total real case because it's more complicated when you you get uh, totally real fields. Okay. Or or part or number fields which are real. real well, just can I just ask a question? Um, in in your examples, do the the rank one forms live in a lattice or no? I think so. Okay, so. I think so. Okay, well, well then I change the problem to, uh, uh, to show when C does not live in a lattice, there are no dead ends. No, no, but I mean, I mean in, in, full in full generality, I mean, you are, you are right that uh, there, there could be uh, the dense. Okay, but I mean, at least for some for some number of fields, we know. For number field, yes. I mean, for the situation which is the closest to the classical one, apparently there are not. So for like say a CM a CM field or potentially totally real, but but not for a general number field, I guess is what you're saying. Well, I'm we'll not sure see. exactly. Well, well, we'll we'll see. So because okay, so. Uh, so it's unclear where the CM uh, hypothesis is going to uh, to enter in the game. So yeah. So it depends what you you want to do. So from from the compactification point of view, may, maybe you you need it, but but for some part, maybe you don't need it. Okay. So, it's unclear. so on the other one, so if you're okay with the, the first one, on yeah, the which other one? one from GLN to SLN. So maybe it's me who don't understand what you mean, because uh, as long as you have uh, a, a group which is of a finite in index with respect to GLN, you can always uh, build a cellular complex from the one from GLN. It's exactly what we did for uh, SLN in our case. So well, the, pro the problem is that SLN is not finite index in GLN in general. Because you have um, the unit group is big. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, in the case where it is finite index, you have no problem. Then I'm not worried. Yeah. Okay, so so it's uh, so you need to insist on, on it on this part because it's, uh, yeah, but so it's so a the bit puzzling. The real problem here is um, is when the when the uh, unit group has non-zero rank. Yeah. So like totally, you know, as soon as, as, soon as you have a non-zero rank unit group, then SLN is no longer finite index inside GLN. Okay, I agree. And now there's a lot more, so there's gonna be sort of extra parts to the symmetric space that are being um, decomposed by the, this polyhedral decomposition, but then, if you, you want to collapse that down to get something for SLN. And so now it's, it's definitely in this more non-trivial geometry happening. And it's not clear to me if it will work or not. I mean, I... Yeah. Oh, okay, I agree. Okay. But, but you, you, you need to uh, point out the, the, the finite uh, index case. Yeah, okay. And Paul, do you see the question from Bill down there? Um, no, let me look. Maybe I forget. If I get away from this, maybe I can see the chat. I, I can't see any. Oh, wait, here we go. I can read it to you. If you can you want read to. it. Read it. I can't. I think I can read it now. For cubic fields, could we use. Yeah, that's what I. That's the kind of thing I'm. So his question says For cubic fields, can we use way restriction to the Galois closure to avoid floating point? I don't know. But I think something like that's a good idea. That probably could work. And when you I mean, I don't even know, for example, that those, I don't know of a, that those forms actually do come from the Galois 
exposure. I, when I said examples show, I just mean literally there's an example and using algedep, I see that that's true. But otherwise I don't know any proof that that's true. I'm waiting, that's a, I'm okay. waiting to oh. <laughs> Yeah. And when you do use floating point arithmetic, can you build some certificate to prove that your polyhedral cell decomposition is correct? I'm sure we could, but of course we didn't. You know, we just went on to the next uh, shiny thing instead of, I mean, def definitely, um, you know, if it's like the Kepler conjecture, okay, then maybe it's, uh, that's a lot. I think, I, I, don't, I don't know what kind of effort is involved in, in doing that. I think it's probably pretty significant and definitely we did not do it, but I believe one could do that. So, so, so as a last comment, maybe uh, uh, remember that we can perform our LLL reduction with floating point arithmetic, both in the case of Euclidean and Mosel matrices. And of course, we can prove the, the reduction is correct. Mm. But uh, yes, we do have some work. Yeah. So, and I've never tried to do that, so I don't know what, what the effort is in doing that, but I... Oh, we need to uh, yeah, the time is moving go on, on. So, so with maybe, the next talk. Um, if there are any questions from the students, no organizers or <laughs> teachers allowed. Any, any? No, that's been. Oh, you have a question. Okay, then, Paul, uh, thank, thanks for. Uh, that's your final uh, lecture, isn't it? But thanks. No, 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 he has no. no I think okay, I. Paul, you unfortunately, you have a few more. Oh, <laughs> thanks for the three so far, really. <laughs> Okay, thank you.